The true seat of power in Frank Herbert's universe of Dune is on the desert world of Arrakis, as it is the only source of the precious spice melange. It can be said without question that whoever controls the spice controls the universe. On this deadly jewel of a planet, however, one life form, the mighty sandworm, reigns supreme. Like the legends of treasure hoarding dragons of old, these fiercely territorial beasts prove themselves to be a formidable deterrent to any who wish to collect the precious spice. As such, seekers of this treasure must go to great lengths to protect themselves from an inevitable attack whenever they step foot into the mighty sandworm's domain. While these massive creatures are certainly one of the biggest threats to human life on Arrakis, they are not invincible. So in this video, I'd like to discuss a few ways in which a sandworm can be killed within the parameters of what was established in Frank Herbert's Dune series. Spoiler warning if you haven't read the books. While many of the details regarding the biology of the sandworms remain shrouded in mystery, a few facts are generally known throughout the Imperium. These creatures are incredibly long-lived, with lifespans extending into the thousands of years. This provides evidence supporting their hardy nature, suggesting that they are difficult to kill. They are also quite massive, as those who ventured into the deep desert of Arrakis have reported specimens measuring up to 450 meters in length, with rumors that in the southern regions of the planet they had grown up to 700 to 1,000 meters, or even longer. At any length, mature sandworms are protected by armor-like plating on their skin, consisting of scales measuring a few feet in diameter. While proving impervious to most common projectile weaponry, the Fremen people discovered a method to manipulate the sandworms by prying open the edge of one or multiple scales, forcing the giant to instinctively roll over, positioning the exposed area away from the desert sand. The Fremen utilized this method to force a sandworm to travel along the surface until it exhausts itself, after which they would typically dismount from the beast and allow it to submerge. However, if it was the intention to kill the sandworm, theoretically the same method might be effective in forcing the beast to remain on the surface while another method is used to destroy it. Given the immense size of the creature and the thickness of its armor plating, formidable firepower would certainly be required for those wishing to accomplish this task with the use of weaponry. Sandworms also possess a tremendous healing factor, enabling them to repair wounded tissue quickly. As such, direct shots from weapons such as a lace gun would likely prove ineffective. While not commonly used, atomic weaponry does exist in the Dune universe, along with a bomb-like weapon called a stone burner. A stone burner, while not considered an atomic itself, uses nuclear energy as a fuel source, which it can redirect as it emits J-rays capable of burrowing into and even destroying the core of a planet. This kind of weaponry would certainly make quick work of a sandworm, However, their use is discouraged or in certain cases even outright banned by the Imperium due to the historical devastation that had been caused by the reckless use of such devices. Readers of Dune often wonder about the deployment of shield technology to lure and potentially destroy the sandworms by means of a well-placed laser gun beam. In Frank Herbert's series, it's established that an interaction of a laser gun beam with a Holtzman shield is capable of producing a devastating explosive reaction. However, the results of this interaction is notoriously inconsistent and unreliable, with no way to control the blast. There's always a possibility that the explosion will happen only on the shooter's end in such a situation as well. All that being said, even if you were successful in triggering a large enough explosion to kill a sandworm with a laser gun and shield combo, it would likely be viewed as a violation of the Great Convention's ban on atomics. And again, in order to successfully implement such an attack, one would have to lure out and possibly find a way to prevent the submersion of a sandworm during the assault. The biggest issue with using this method was brought out by the Imperial planetologist Liet Kynes in the first book when he said they can be stunned and shattered by explosives, but each ring segment has a life of its own. Barring atomics, he knew of no explosive powerful enough to destroy a large worm entirely. 
Liette also brought out that the only other known means to kill and preserve one of these creatures whole was through the use of a high-voltage electrical shock applied separately to each ring segment. If it weren't for the lack of the substance on the planet, perhaps the simplest way to destroy one of these creatures is with water. Even relatively small doses of water can prove fatal to a sandworm if it is able to make it into the creature's system. As such, readers have often wondered why sandworms wouldn't die after they swallow up water-heavy objects like humans or animals in the open desert. Perhaps the biggest reason why this wouldn't harm the sandworm is due to the extreme heat produced by its furnace-like insides. Because of this, it's likely that smaller amounts of water that make their way into the maw of the beast would evaporate as it came into contact with such heat. Also, given the immense size of these creatures, even if a worm swallowed a few humans at a time, it would likely only prove to introduce trace amounts of water into the worm's system and not enough to kill it. These occurrences are rather rare, as the sandworms do not rely on any water-rich creature for food. If one were able to get enough water into a sandworm, the result would be a violent and painful death for the creature. This is evidenced by the Fremen's use of water to drown small, stunted sandworms to retrieve the toxic liquid needed for their Reverend Mother's Water of Life ceremony. Being able to find enough water on Arrakis, however, is another rather large hurdle, as countless larval sandworms called sand trout continuously work to rid the environment of open water as part of their life cycle. So it can be said that one of the sandworm's biggest defenses against the threat of water is the very nature of the planet itself, which they have effectively terraformed to suit their needs. Through the course of Frank Herbert's series, it is revealed that the sandworm's life cycle is responsible for the production of Spice Melange. The powers of the Imperium are made to recognize that he who can destroy a thing, controls a thing. So in order to ultimately control the precious Spice Melange, one would need to control or limit the sandworms that produce it. This is largely accomplished by the Fremen's terraforming efforts of Arrakis, as allowed and overseen by Paul Atreides and his son, Leto II. The terraforming of the planet would be accomplished in part through the introduction of a predator fish, which would prevent the sand trout from locking water away. As the planet grew greener, and as more water canots were established, the sandworm's numbers would diminish over time, along with the sand trout's ability to adequately dry out the environment. While terraforming is certainly the most drastic and time-consuming method to eliminate these creatures, this is the method in which most of the sandworms on Arrakis die during Leto's reign as God Emperor. Even he himself, as a human-sandworm hybrid, died by drowning in the Idaho River on Arrakis. Shortly thereafter, his body disintegrated into thousands of sand trout, starting yet another sandworm cycle, which would prove to turn Arrakis into a desert once again. But I'm curious to know which tactic for killing a sandworm you think would be most feasible. Is there a method I didn't mention in this video that you think would be effective? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy news and lore. Thank you all so much for your support. And as always, have a very nerdy day.